Whoa. Mm -hmm. I think I just figured something out, Beavis. <laughs> what? <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> yeah, me. It really sucks. Me. <laughs> This sucks more than anything that has ever sucked before. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And I was expecting to do a comic books writing 101 video with Mark Pellegrini and Aaron Sparrow today. But but Aaron is feeling under the weather. But Mark is available. And I said, we should do something. And there's a video I've been wanting to do about just like five of the worst comic book pages in modern history. Now, there, there are certainly things that we could add to this, you know, learning that or Norman Osborn was banging Gwen Stacy, you know, oh, before man. Peter Parker. There was, you know, Hail Hydra Cap and, and all that stuff. You know, Batman the Wedding. The that kind of feels like easy mode, though, you know, picking on those books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we want to do something a little bit more fun. Pick, pick some things maybe people are aware of or maybe comics they didn't even know existed or panels that didn't know existed. Have some fun with them. Point out what's wrong with them and laugh at some really bad dialogue. People are going to be begging for Bendis when we're done with this video. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously here with me is Mark Pellegrini, comic book writer, big time star on the indie publishing scene with Common America and Black Ops GI. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. It's good to be on here. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the curriculum you had for the Writing Tips 101 was about heroic character writing. And I know you wanted to originally do it just uh, you and me, but I was like, oh, you, you gotta get Aaron in on this one. The guy who writes Darkwing Duck, he's gotta, he's gotta do this topic. Absolutely, yeah, and this this is how not to write heroic characters. Too. So oh these are some examples on not what what not to do before you get ready for next week. So it's still an educational episode. <laughs> Absolutely. So here, let's let's get into this. This is the first one. We're going to go to Tom King's Batman. We said we wouldn't do the wedding, and I'm not going to, but we do have issue 48. Two issues before the wedding happened, we have. The best man story arc where Joker's upset that he's not going to be part of Batman's wedding. He's in a chapel. He takes a young bride as his hostage. Batman is looking him in the face. He blows her head off. And guess what happens to him? He nothing. Just, Batman does absolutely nothing. He, he just, just Batman's just standing there like, like, oh, well, I guess she's dead. I mean, <laughs> uh, so we've had that story uh, a thousand times, you know where Batman fails to save a life, and so he, he's racked with guilt over it. This feels like Batman's already read all those stories, and he's over it. So he's like, eh, whatever. <laughs> you oh, think that'll more. stop me? Just blow her head off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know, it, it is trying so, it's try hard, you know? It's trying to be edgy. And it's, it's trying to be edgy and funny at the same time, and it's succeeding at neither. That dialogue that the Joker is doing, he's like, whoops, I, I killed my hostage by accident. Are any of you alive? Um, can one of you be my hostages? Ha, ha, ha. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's like, uh. Well, So it, it gets worse. This was the first real sign I think people, well, there, there were signs before this, but this was the first terrible issue of Batman. And after this, guess who he takes hostage? Uh, to, just tell me. <laughs> Himself. He puts a gun to his head and Batman won't do anything to stop him and sits down and prays with him before he shoots Batman in the head. <laughs> you know, you could have just made all that up right now. You know, I'm not going to, I, Lord knows I'm not going to go and try and review this to, to fact check you, but that, that sounds too awful not to be real. Oh, and... it's real. It's damn real. That's the problem. But that's, uh, you know, Tom King does not get Batman. Batman is one of the most, um, competent superheroes in the world if you have someone and you put a gun to their head in front of him he's gonna find a way you know to, to get I, to you i feel like uh batman just by virtue of his career of doing this every night since he was in his 20s he's been in that scenario of the the hostage with the gun to their head like he does that twice a week and he's already formulated a plan for getting the hostage out of that alive so for him to fail at that it's like for Batman, that's like him failing to walk and chew gum at the same time. I mean, this is a truly incompetent Batman. Yes. And then Joker puts a gun to his own head. He sits down and takes a prayer with him to, for his forgiveness, I guess, before he shoots him. And it, uh, it's, it's so frustrating, so stupid. And this is exhibit A on what Tom King does not get about Batman. This is one of the worst pages in Batman comics history. Well, it's, it's just like awful. you said, Batman, it's not it's it's worse than batman not doing anything to uh to save the girl 
it's that he's not even reacting after she gets her, her head blown off. You know, like another writer or another artist who is laying that out would have put an inset panel of Batman, you know, grieving and screaming like, Joker, how could you? Uh, like some sort of reaction that he, he gives a damn. This is like the, you know, this is this is like the Zack Snyder Man of Steel where yeah. Superman's just knocking over skyscrapers and, and slaughtering people and he doesn't stop once to, to look or care. This is, I guess, the modern day grim, dark, uh, post Chris Nolan, post uh, Zack Snyder superhero, you know, at least on the DC side of things where they just, everybody seems to be the Punisher now. <laughs> yeah. So this is amongst the worst characterization I've ever seen in a comic book. Now let's get to some of the, just a, a terrible moment that just, draws you right out of a, a storyline or, or even a comic book run. Now, Jason Aaron introduced the female Thor, Jane Foster, during his run. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, it was quite popular. But this is one of those pages that you can't... It's unfathomable what's, what's happening here. So you have Titania is fighting Lady Thor. And this is what she says. She, after she knocks her husband out, she says, I ain't fighting no woman Thor, and neither is he. Not today, at least. I'm standing down out of respect for what you're doing. Can't have can't have been easy for you. Has been easy for me either. And then she goes on to talk about girl power and stuff like that. And then so everybody Titania, clapped. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Titania has been fighting female superheroes essentially since she's been introduced in in comic books. One of the main adversaries is She-Hulk. But now that she's seen a Lady Thor, oh my goodness. She was overcome with admiration for the hero who's trying to stop her, and just she, never, she must yeah, stand up. Didn't didn't you know uh, female superheroes didn't exist before Jane Foster Thor? Th this is a first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's one of those things where they have to they you, like I said they take you out of the moment. They have to basically break character, look at the camera, and deliver a public service announcement. That's what. That's what this is. This is like uh, when He-Man stops fighting Skeletor and says, we had fun today, kids, but I want to talk to you seriously for a minute about drugs. And that's like what this feels like, where she's like, okay, we're having a lot of fun here, you know, fighting and doing comic book stuff. But I want to take a moment to talk about uh, feminism and talk about female empowerment. And it's, it's, uh, but so, so many books are written this way now. It's, it's tiresome. Here's the end. <laughs> But just so you know, this is a one-time girl power moment, uh, uh, girl power pass. Next time you get my way, I will rip your head off and toss it in the Hudson. So she's back to being a villain. And Jane Foster says, very well, just so you know, I'm going to hit you now rather hard. And she replies, kind of thought you might. Then she hits her in the face with a hammer. Very so proudly a, getting hit in the face with a hammer. Uh, two in a row of just these writers – thinking they're funnier than they really are. And it, it's it's not clever. It's not cute. Uh, it's really distracting and really obnoxious. And how many how many readers does that hemorrhage? That one page, you yes. know, it hemorrhages how many customers every time they do it and <laughs> they keep doing it. Like how many people walked away from Jason Aaron's Thor run because this, this page finally showed up? This, you know, it's amazing, this, too, because yeah. I liked uh, Jason Aaron's run on Ghost Rider. I thought he was a really good Ghost Rider author. And it seems like everything he's done since then has has been just unreadable. I guess this really isn't his wheelhouse. The, the guy who, who did, like, motorcycle chainsaw nuns on Ghost Rider is now trying to write a book about feminism. And you can tell he's completely out of his depth and out of his element. Yeah, it's, it's just it just stands out. It's like, I can't read this anymore. So let's talk. Let's get back to a DC character. Let's talk about Superman. We've been talking about how you can't have a, a Superman that represents anything American in nature. We've got Superman 900. So this is the oldest comic. I believe this was 2011. So a little over 10 years old from David Goyer, who I believe is a screenwriter. Yeah. And he's uh, Superman is talking to the I believe the the national uh, security rep or something. Somebody for the president. So what purpose did you have showboating? Did your show, showboating serve? Your actions have created an international incident. The Iranian government is accusing you of acting on the president's behalf. They're calling your interference an act of war. I realize that. And you're right, of course, it was foolish, which is why I intend to speak before the United Nations tomorrow and inform them that I'm renouncing my U.S. citizenship. What? I'm tired of having my actions construed as instruments of U.S. policy. Truth, justice, and the American way is not enough anymore. Well, that is enough 
to drive I don't know how many thousands of readers off the off the payroll to to continue funding your comic book. But you it's, just it's it's this idea that so Superman is an American icon. He he's practically synonymous with Uncle Sam as just the visual representation of America. That's why he has that statement that they decided to to put. He's in not there a representation American of, of American policy, though. He's a no, representation he, of what what American could be. He's basically like our mascot, you know. Yeah. That that's that's what America could be. It's the ideals of America, the American way, that part of truth, justice, and the American way. So they're trying to tear him down and break him down, and that's something David Goyer is fond of because he's. Uh, I believe he also wrote Man of Steel. Um, then he also write like Batman Begins, and um, yeah. So the ideals that Superman was was based on. He grew up in Kansas, raised on a farm, the very down-home country essentials of the American Midwest. And that's something David Goyer hates, at least about Superman, whenever he writes him. So in Man of Steel, you have uh, Pa Kent, uh, Kevin Costner, giving him like the worst possible advice, saying, like, you know, you probably should have just let that school bus of kids die because you, you don't want to reveal your powers. Like, no, no, son, don't save me from this tornado. Um, you might reveal your powers. Just let people die. He's it's like he's deliberately giving his son bad advice. And it's like, look, these are the values of Midwestern America that Clark was uh, raised on. Isn't that terrible? America's awful. And now he's writing a story where Superman uh basically spits out the words truth justice in the ugh, american way and and wants to renounce his citizenship you know embrace globalism like i don't want to represent america anymore like the world america's too small the world is too big i uh it's it's after of course he was celebrating with the the peaceful protesters in tehran yeah the peaceful protesters i'm sure <laughs> But it's, it's this little by little, brick by brick, tearing down at the foundations that make people proud to be American, identify as American. And it's just one more chip away at that to get us closer to, um, you know, this universal globalism kind of attitude. Um, very Hollywood, very Californian, uh, very David Goyer. Absolutely. So let's get in. OK, this is the worst. This is the worst dialogue I've ever read in a comic book. Oh, this no, is... I, I can see the so... preview. <laughs> so America is was a weird idea to begin. Well, not a weird idea. You're going to replace Miss America, a long uh, time comic book hero, with a new Latinx queer representation as America Chavez, the new America. But the writer, Gabby Rivera, who I think was doing YA graphic novels, like she's this America Chavez is an American. You know, she's not even from Latin America. She's from another planet. <laughs> and she's not really she's not really queer because on that planet I think there's only women. So it, it, it was really strange the way that this was executed. Everything about that character is a train wreck. It's it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason Gabby Rivera essentially once this run is over has never written another comic book again. But so at this point America Chavez, I believe she saves the day, she wins it, and she gets the girl. And this is the the character in the car admiring them as they fly away. I'm literally intrigued and in awe of both of them. Is If this is what it's like to date other women, then I applaud all the women dating women right now because this is incredible. Motorcycle courtship chase? Check. Missiles and explosions? Yep. And now we're just flying together in the sky. Heading to a giant heart. I swear, if they come back married, I'm going to be so jealous. <sighs> Always the bride's best archer, never the archer bride. Good lord, I, I'm cringing into, into a freaking heap on the floor just listening to that. I mean, someone was paid to write that, and some people paid money to read that, and it, it's unbelievable. But this is a lot like that uh, Jane Foster Thor page uh, you posted where this isn't natural human speech. This is emotional validation. This is what the Gabby Rivera, the author, is writing the thing that they want to hear, you know, that uh, what they want looking you at yourself, to feel while looking at the page rather than letting you feel it. It's the praise that they want to have heaped upon themselves. It's like, you know, that that. SNL sketch for the, the guy looking in the mirror in the morning saying, you know, like, you're handsome, 
you're brave and you're a very good fella or something like I'm that. I'm good it's... enough. I'm smart enough. And gosh <laughs> darn it, people like you. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, oh, man. Um, but that's exactly. <laughs> Stuart Smalley. That's what this reads like. It's like, I am literally intrigued and in awe of both of them. They're amazing. They're phenomenal. Like all women who date other women are incredible. They're heroes. And I am literally shaking right now. It's, it's exactly the same sort of thing. It's Gabby Rivera looking in the mirror and telling her the things that she wants to hear other people tell her. Uh, it's, it's very egotistical writing, very self-serving. And it doesn't read well to anyone. <laughs> it does make you miss Brian Michael Bendis. I told you you would be oh. praying for Brian Michael Bendis to return to the pay or to the to the Thinking Critical oh, Comic Book Podcast after you saw this page. Can you imagine Bendis trying to take that speech and, and pad that out? Like that's the entire those those two speech bubbles there are all the that's dialogue in the entire twenty-two page comic. That's an issue. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So yeah, that's that is without a doubt the worst dialogue I've ever seen in not just in a comic book, but just in writing. Well, like, they it, there's a point where merit doesn't really factor in anymore because I know Gabby Rivera was just like heaped with awards and praise, and every single you know pop culture multimedia website was just running uh, pit, cut and paste articles about how great a writer she is, how great this comic is. When anyone can look at that page and read it and objectively tell for themselves that it's crap. Yet, if you look, if you were to just you know go onto Google and say Gabby Rivera, America Chavez, you're just going to get like ten pages straight uh, of you know praise and praise and praise for how good this book is. When <laughs> the objective reality is that it's garbage. So moving from a page that offends me just on a readership level, I know this is garbage. It's something that I found more offensive just because of the characterization, not even of the person speaking, but the person receiving and the way that they reacted. This is from Green Lanterns 49 from Aaron Gillespie. He was one of the um, like DC Comics writers class. Like He was in, in one of those Scott Snyder classes. He got initially some work. He got the story on Green Lanterns. It was never finished. This is the last comic of his run. I think he got two issues. Like I said, the story never ends, but it's because of this page, likely. It was one of the worst things I've ever read in my life. I pulled Green Lanterns off my off my list of comics to read and, and buy because of this issue. And then on issue 50, Dan Jurgens arrives to save the series. So Jessica Cruz has been accused of murder. Everything in the world looks like she did probably murder this person. Simon Bass has come to her aid to rescue her or help her out. And she is innocent, you know, but but nobody knows that Hal Jordan arrives, the greatest Green Lantern of all times, and he's going to take her in. This is what he says. You two are free to go until we look into this. And then she says, oh, bite me. And he's like, whoa, just you. Whoa, why start investigating things now? You seem perfectly content cowboying your way around before. I'd expect someone who's been in the game as long as you to be a lot more woke. Hal Jordan profusely apologizes and gives her a ring back immediately. You know, I will at least say that for the past 40 years, ever since Denny O'Neill, that is in character for Hal Jordan. I can tell what the writer's doing. He's trying to do one of those, uh, like, you've done an awful lot of things for the orange man and the purple man and the blue man, but what have you done for the black man, Mr. Green Lantern? He's like, I'm sorry for being racist and a blue... He always... Whenever he's approached by someone who reproaches him with like, you're this, you're that, you're bad. He always like just succumbs and turns into Eeyore and like, I'm sorry, I'm the worst. And one of the reasons why I don't really like Hal Jordan, he's not always written that way. But you can tell when someone, you know, they're like baby's first investigation into classic comic books. They read the, the Denny O'Neill run and like, oh, that's what Green Lantern needs to be. The, the hard travel and heroes kind of thing. And it was bad in 1970s, and it's bad when people are aping it now. It's still bad. You know, a, co a copy of a copy is is even worse. And that that's all this is is they're trying to do the same thing Denny O'Neill did back in the 70s. They're trying to hit those same notes, but put their own spin on it. And it still doesn't make any sense. And it still requires Hal Jordan to not have the wherewithal to defend himself. 
to let himself be portrayed as the bad guy, as in the wrong, which feels, com which reads completely inauthentically. And you're just sitting there screaming, you know, in, in your inner monologue, what Hal Jordan should be saying in this situation, and he isn't. And all that does is bother you. You know, when, when that, that old black man from the, the Denny O'Neill run says, what have you done for the black man, Mr. Green Lantern? You're, all you can think of is like, I've saved the planet a thousand times. I've saved the universe. You live in the universe. You're welcome. You know, a thousand different things he could say instead of, I'm sorry for being racist. Uh, and the same thing in this situation. It's like, why are you starting to investigate now? You should be more woke. But yeah, and you should be in handcuffs. Come on, we're going to jail. But no, they, uh, they, the message that they want to get across, like it supersedes actual authentic writing and the quality of the writing. And that's been a dilemma in all these pages you've been showing me. <laughs> As someone who's worked somewhat closely with fighter pilots in the past and how Jordan is a, you know, he was a fighter pilot, he becomes a test pilot. I can tell you, you cannot speak to those men like this. They are the most confident, overly confident, for, sometimes for no reason, like to a fault people in the world. And if you ever spoke to them and they had a power ring on their finger, they would probably use it on you. So it just, it just infuriates me that he takes it. And then he's like, Oh, well, here's your ring back. I was, uh, I remember during the Jeff Johns run on green lantern, he was like that. He was just punching the hell out of everybody. Even like other officers in the tarmac, if they spoke up to him, he just belted Perfect. them in the jaw. And that's that kind of Hal Jordan I like, is the Hal Jordan <laughs> that will stand up for himself. I feel like everyone looks to the hard traveling heroes because it's the most famous storyline as like, this is what the character should be. This is the most authentic version. Like, no, that was out of character when it was written in the 70s. And it's out of character now. Just stop. Just flush that book down the toilet, please. And Aaron Gillespie isn't Denny O'Neill. No, and that's the thing, too, is that I, I know I'm picking on Denny O'Neill, but Denny O'Neill, he wrote a lot of great stories. His run on Batman is fantastic, but, oh, man, like, he could write bad stories, too. And, you know, you're, people are picking one of his worst runs as, as you know, the, the quintessential Denny O'Neill when it's really probably the worst thing he ever wrote. <laughs> So there you go. Those are five pages that I say are absolutely terrible as far as modern comic books. Mark, did I did I find enough cringe? Did I find enough terrible for you? Well, I mean, you did a good enough job. Anybody who reads those five pages will never want to read another comic book for the rest of their life. You may have probably just soiled comics uh, for everyone. <laughs> but that's the thing, too, is that why would anyone want to read comics right now, at least mainstream ones? Because the ones you chose are all like Marvel and DC. And when they're all written that way, why well, would they're not want all to written these, for them? these stand out. These stand out, but there are so many that are written in that fashion. And it's not enjoyable. I think even for the, the people they are placating towards, the people that, they're, that they think want to read comics that are written that way, they still don't enjoy those comics because even when they're telling you what you want to hear, even when they're patronizing you, they still don't read well and they're still not enjoyable. And so the audience that they're writing these for aren't reading or buying the books. There's just no point to it. <laughs> yeah. So I thought we'd have some fun. This, this is how you do not, this is how not to develop heroic characters next week we'll be talking with mark and aaron sparrow on how to actually develop your heroic characters i've already got the syllabus and everything ready we just need aaron to, to do it so mark you got anything else to say about some of the worst comic pages i've seen in modern in modern comic you know books? you you can learn a lot from reading things that you enjoy but you can learn even more from reading things you hate because <laughs> then you you learn how not to do things and man, I feel like this is the most educational episode of Writing Tips 101 we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, buddy. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you next week. See you.